Welcome back and thanks for joining us for part two of our conversation with the Interior Business Center. Once again, I'm joined by Byron Atkins, the Director of the Interior Business Center at the Interior Department. Byron, thanks for uh, coming back on and, and, and joining us for part two. Good to be here. In the first segment, we talked a lot about your IT modernization plans. We talked about the eventual move to the cloud, the roadmap and framework you're putting together, which is really important as you kind of start off on this modernization journey. And we ended up talking in the last segment about robotics process automation, and it's something that obviously customers are driving. And, and I want to start there because I think the use of RPA and the recognition of what customers are both asking for and what they need is, is hugely important for any agency. So the data and the analytics around that, that's what's maybe driving that, not just that feedback session, but how you're using the data and analytics. So start there. What kind of data are you collecting and how are you using it to drive that customer experience improvements? Certainly. So right now, um, you know, as a shared service provider, uh, you know, it's definitely critical that we provide our customers with data on our service delivery metrics. Um, and we want to be transparent about that. And so these metrics are often included in all of our annual service level agreements with our, with our clients. And then throughout the year, um, we post these metrics on our customer uh, portal. Um, and this is a web page that we use to share performance about uh, what we're doing. And, and we transparently share this with, with our clients. And so um, we use these metrics to inform us operationally um, as to whether there are opportunities to enhance our services. Um, and for example, if we know a decline in a metric in a certain area, uh, we can examine that area to better understand what's happening and adjust our processes to enhance the client's experience um, and I'll definitely tell you, you know, our partner organization, with his, which is the department CIO office, um, they um, provide uh, support in our customer support center. And so they provide tier one support um, to our customers across many services. And so with uh, that data, we get monthly uh, reports as far as performance met metrics. And then we try to examine those metrics to look for opportunity for service enhancements and look for trends. Um, related to those customer contacts that we get in areas that we can enhance our tools um, and process changes. And so um, oftentimes, this is our best way to get ahead of a particular problem that we have as far as a user experience on a particular system that we may use um, based upon the uptick in the amount of calls um, that we get in the customer report system. I also want to talk about, um, you know, the tools that we provide um, to our customers to support their data and analytics. And so, um, you know, I think I mentioned, and if I didn't, the API, um, this is an opportunity that we uh, use to enhance data integrity um, and efficiency by reusing the same data across multiple systems, uh, which means no um, duplicative data entry um, and less room for ad error across multiple systems. This, that ties it all together. Um, and so that absolutely, in my opinion, um, avoids a lot of rework and tremendous cost avoidance um, related to duplication of data entry. Um, and we provide a data warehouse as well for self-serve reporting capabilities to our clients that they can use as well. Um, this data is very helpful. Um, there's also um, feedback that we get um, to look at where there are opportunities to provide self-serve uh, opportunities to our customers, which also um, provides opportunity for cost avoidance because if customers can service themselves, they don't have to call into the customer support system. So that means less labor and support associated with there. And so that's been some of the ways we've been able to use data. I and mean, I think there are some tremendous opportunities that we can catapult from that as well moving forward in the future. Um, but that's where we're using it currently today. It's interesting that you it's you're using that tier one support for, okay, we're seeing an uptick in this area. Now let's address it. Anything comes to mind where maybe over the last couple of years you've you've seen that uptick and you were able to address it fairly quickly? It could be very something simple, or maybe you added some technology like a chat bot or something there to, to really address some of those challenges. Yeah, absolutely. One of the uh, platforms we use is our learning management and our performance management system. Um, it's a combined system. Um, uh, the only one that I know of in the federal government. Um, but there could be others. And, and so part of our performance management system, there are multiple steps that you get towards um, the final signature from the supervisor to say, hey, here's the rating that you got. Um, we found and we got feedback. It was a, it was, um, a design glitch um, that folks didn't have the ability to go back um, uh, in the process if they made an error at a, at a certain step. And I forget what step it is. 
Um, and so that was good feedback um, to understand one most initially is to come up with some workaround um, and some job aids to say, hey, to avoid having to go back, this is what you need to do up front to get that done. The other aspect of it was um, to look at as far as a plan and to say, how can we um, modify, adjust and work with the vendor to allow that flexibility, even if someone makes an error and, and doesn't follow the process as it should. And so that's a direct example of where we were able to use that feedback um, based upon the uptick. And so what was happening around performance time, you could clearly see in the numbers that you're getting a lot of calls. And then the customer support center could even um, put those in buckets to say, here's what this was, you know. 75% was about being able to um, do the step back um, portion of the performance management um, tool. And so that provided us the data that we need, needed and direct customer experience and feedback about the particular um, system that we had. And then most immediately being able to provide some work aids to say, hey, here's how you avoid not having to do that. And oh, by the way, as we start planning for future enhancements for the next year, that'll be something we work with the vendor to design out. I also heard you mention around your data warehouse. Is this something that has relatively new or something that's been around for quite a while? And are you now able to apply APIs even internally to help make better use of that data? Yeah, it, it, it's been over the last five years that we, we've been able to do that. And um, certainly, um, you know, it's, it's a resource and a tool that we found tremendous um, utility and we plan to use amongst more systems uh, moving forward. Um, this is a great opportunity. Um, and it, it just makes sense to us um, to be able to have that capability. It also allows us to expand our reach to a, and, and diversify our customer base um, and having the ability to work amongst multiple different systems um, to exchange data. And so we, we do see this as a, as, as a great opportunity in the future, um, but it is something we've been working on for a little while. All right. Sounds like something more to follow up in time as you continue down this modernization path. Byron, we've talked a lot about cloud and we've talked a lot about data a little bit and, and, and a lot about your kind of plans going forward. So I'm going to ask you the, the, the question that every uh, director in, in your position loves to ask. All right. So what else are you doing? What else are you working on? Because your plate obviously is not quite full enough. You have a little bit more room on the side there. Uh, <laughs> so what other priorities are you, are you working on over the next six or nine months? Yeah, I, it's a great question. And I, I'll, I will tell you, you know, first of all, we want to maintain um, the service and the service levels that we're providing. It's very important to us that um, you know, we continue the good work that we're doing and we meet the expectations of our customers. And so you know, I always say it's easy to keep a customer than it is to uh, attract and, and gain a new customer. And so that's important. So we do a lot of maintenance associated um, with that. The other part of it, and you know, I think all agencies are, are, are dealing with this, um, but we have tremendously talented employees. And so a big piece of what we've been doing is, has been focusing on our employee experience um, from the very start when we start new employee orientation um, to moving forward and migrating as they get settled in uh, to make sure that we have the best and brightest um, doing the jobs that, that we're doing for our customers, but also equipping them with the tool training and resources um, that just creates a great customer experience. And so um, a lot of that is, is providing the training that they need to have uh, to be relevant in their community or practice, um, making sure that um, they are getting exposure and, and opportunities um, to uh, get involved uh, with their community or practice. Um, and then also some of the programs that we have, a lot of them are leadership development, but also emerging leader programs that we are trying to grow our own um, within the interior business center. And so, you know, it's always my, my hope um, that when an employee comes to the Department of Interior, but particularly the Interior Business Center, they'll look back on this experience and say, wow, that was a great opportunity. I had um, all the resources that I need and I grew and I, I had the opportunity to really blossom into um, this future leader um, that, that they are. And so that's something that's very important to me, particularly um, as it relates to some of the hard field positions that we have um, in our contract and acquisition. Um, we're really looking at um, you know, how we can give the mo most flexibility, um, but also retain the great talent that we have. And so um, we have uh, you know, a hybrid work situation. We have some folks that are remote um, and we're embracing that because we want to be competitive um, in the marketplace and be sure that we're providing the resources that we need um, so that folks can exercise their fullest potential um, wherever they are. Um, but also making sure that um, we're doing everything we can to allow them to focus on the work that they need to do. And so we have a lot of 
uh, little things in place that allow um, them to stay really more focused on the particular uh, responsibility that they have. So maybe it's travel vouchers and, and certainly there's required training that goes on that has to get done. But um, in most instances, we try to pro provide support um, so that they can focus truly on servicing the customer um, and, and stay there and stay in that space. And so that's a very important to me. Um, I always want to do as much as we can for our employees. Um, and really, um, it's an investment into the future um, workforce and leadership of the Interior Business Center. And so we really are going to double down on that a bit more um, as we enter into the next fiscal year. I'm glad you brought up the workforce piece. One of the things we've heard from a lot of agencies is the time and the effort to hire and, and bring in new employees. So they're spending a lot of time also on retainment. You mentioned the learning management system. How are you using that and how has that evolved over the last few years to address both skill sets that you need today and tomorrow, but also to ensure employees see a path for themselves to continue to progress in their careers? So one of the things that we have, and, and, and again, I think we're the only federal provider that provides a performance management system, a learning management system, and a competency-based system as well. And so um, one, obviously the learning management system that we have um, uh, provides opportunity to take the required training, but there's also real resources and tools in there to assess um, and better understand where their competency gaps within not just our employees, but all of um, the Department of Interior and the customers that utilize that. And so I'm super proud of that um, as another resource and capability um, to really take a look at where there could be gaps, um, you know, based upon the assessment and where we should spend um, the most time to get the best return on our investments associated um, with equipping our employees to do uh, the work that they need to do. And so um, we're really excited about that. And it's all in one system. Um, and so one login, one system, um, and it tracks what you've been done, what's been done as far as from learning management and size, and that, that's cross-pollinated with the competency um, uh, portal as well. And so that's one aspect of where we've been able to use our, our, our own system um, to be able to, to do that type of assessment. And um, you know, using that data, we can figure out where we need to make those investments, whether it's training or mentoring uh, and developing our workforce to make sure that they have the resources uh, and the skill sets to do the job that they do. Generally speaking, and, and I think every agency is facing the uphill climb, but have you been able to fill positions? Are you struggling in some areas like 1102s, acquisition folks, but easier in maybe other positions? What are some of the, the trends from a workforce perspective that you, you guys are facing uh, over the last year or two or, or longer? So we, we, we try to do as much as we can, um, again, to, to retain the folks that we have, but uh, much like other agencies, um, you know, 1102s continue to be, you know, a challenge um, to recruit and retain those, particularly uh, in, in the D.C. area. It's, it's a lot of competition there. And, and, and that's where we've been able to really leverage, um, you know, the voting and investing into that employee experience, um, but also providing the flexi as much flexibility as we can um, to create that work environment that employees don't want to leave. Um, we also are, are working now and, and in partnership with one of our vendors to, to train our own, um, but also what we call kind of a pipeline program that we can uh, bring in um, entry level uh, 1102s, kind of go through a process where we, we train them within our uh, acquisition academy uh, to kind of grow our own. Um, and, and that's produced pretty good results for us. Um, but we're trying to posture ourselves for the future because there's a good portion of our workforce also that will soon be retirement eligible. And so uh, we have to be cognizant of that. As how, what are we building, the, you know, building the pipeline, if you will, um, for competent and capable, uh, you know, 1102s to, to fill those gaps. Um, but uh, again, you know, I, I say it all the time, it's, it's much easier to, um, you know, kind of have the voice of the employee to understand what their needs are um, so that you can retain that talent versus, you know, spending six months to a year to uh, recruit new talent um, and hope that you get the right pick. Byron, another piece of this, when we talk about the workforce, of course, is diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. A big push from the Biden administration really to include that in, in you know, not to not to play on words here, but in a more broad way across all agencies. And, and of course, your customer experience part two. How is DINA kind of working into your strategies? Yeah, so that that is uh, one of our top goals um, for this year, but also uh, doubling down on it for next year. Um, we are actually in the process of uh, recruiting a DIA uh, program manager to um, 
better assist um, as it relates to um, how we can be a more inclusive um, and diverse organization um, to have that individual at the table um, to help set up some programs and what we're doing. I can tell you one of the things that we're doing is, is, is working to, to partner, um, for example, with um, historically black colleges and universities as it relates to uh, trying to recruit and create programs to, 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 to bring that, uh, that group uh, and the demographic in. Um, as well as Hispanic serving institutions as well. Um, so we have some initiatives going on there, but really um, creating a forum for where folks um, feel that they uh, can be included. Um, and a lot of that is done with listening sessions that I personally do um, and uh, town halls uh, that we open, um, create an open environment um, for our employees um, uh, to understand that they're welcome um, and that we're being inclusive as, as possible. And so um, that has certainly um, been a big priority um, for the administration, as well as um, Department of Interior Leadership. Um, I, I happen to be a DEIA champion um, for the Department of, of the Interior for Executive Order 1475-075. Um, um, and so we're going to be working across the department, um, along with my co-chair, um, to really see how we can best support that executive order and improve the experience of our employees. And so... Um, both on a, on a department-wide level, um, that's something that I'm actively engaged in and, and absolutely um, feel is important, but also we're working um, particularly within internal to the Interior Business Center to make sure that we're creating that type of environment. And so um, that's important to us, um, and, and we want to make sure that we are uh, valuing diversity um, in uh, the way that we approach in, in our hiring, um, but also creating a, a workplace uh, where folks feel safe I was going to ask about the hiring piece, because when you talk about recruitment, there's been a big push from the administration to look at recruitment in a different way. Uh, is there anything you all are doing or planning to do for, let's say, 2023 that would kind of take in those uh, concepts around DINA and, and apply it to your recruiting side? Is there any, any plans yet? One of the things that, that the department has done it has been um, some targeted recruitment to um, within some of the special interest groups um, that represent, you know, the demographics of the United States. And so that's something that's been uh, particularly useful to do that. Um, uh, there are several, several different interest groups and advisor groups that, that um, absolutely provide that type of representation. Um, but the biggest thing that we're doing, and, and, and we're just more conscious of you know, having diverse panels um, as we approach hiring um, that um, include folks from marginalized communities um, as well. Um, I think that is a focus that, you know, Absolutely, I have um, doubled down on to make sure that folks have see representation when they when they come to uh, applying and, and interviewing with, with the Interior Business Center. Uh, these are things and concepts that the department also is, is pushing as well. And so, um, you know, I'm happy to say that, that that we're adding a focus to that to make sure that um, we, in fact, are uh, keeping a mindful eye of um, our, our data associated for the demographics of where we are and, and look at where there's opportunities to make sure that we are making efforts to create a workforce that looks like America. And then I think, as you said, there, there's a lot that goes into this. I'm sure there's a lot more to uh, we'll hear from IBC interior more broadly about uh, these efforts to, uh, to be more inclusive in, in both how you hire and the atmosphere and the, the environment that you create within the, the agency. Byron, we're almost out of time, and I've very much enjoyed our conversation. Before I let you go, as, as I mentioned earlier, I know a lot of vendors do listen to uh, these programs, so I want to give you that opportunity to maybe talk to the vendors a little bit. How do you want them to work with your office so you're not inundated with emails or, or marketing uh, uh, gobbledygook? <laughs> well, I, I'm never too busy for our vendors, and, and let me just say um, we are eager to partner with vendors in providing um, you know, our future system solutions. Um, vendors do need to be aware that there are some complex regulatory environments impacting um, our administrative areas, such as human resources and financial management. But as a shared service provider, I think it's important to maintain that balance of offering services solutions um, that meet um, you know, individual client needs. And so as it relates to partnering with us and the federal government, um, you know, we wanna make sure that um, we're being a good partner. Uh, we're absolutely open to you know, having discussions. Um, in some instances, you know, you, you, you may, I may point you in a, in, into the SME's direction uh, if, if there's a, a, a particular question about our approach, particularly our cloud strategy, um, or make that inclusive conversation of others beyond myself. 
Um, but that is absolutely, I, I think, our responsibility of the federal government to, to partner with um, you know, industry and our vendors. Um, ultimately, we want to provide the best solution to our customers. And so that may uh, mean a combination of different strategies and approaches. But I think all of those will include some type of partnership with industry and, and our vendors there. And so I'm absolutely open to, to having discussions. Um, uh, we are, there's a number of different forums um, that we are prepping up to do to be able to actually have some dialogue about what we think we want to do and, and to get um, you know, vendor feedback. Um, uh, we are very active in the Shared Service Leadership Coalition, and um, they provide a, a form for that. But there are a, a number of other organizations as well um, that once we get close to uh, really um, hardening that roadmap, that we, we'd love to get that level of feedback. So we're, we're definitely open to, to having those conversations and and, um, you know, uh, if you reach out to me, I'll, I'll point you in the right direction if, if I don't have that direct answer, but we can, you know, partner to at least have a discussion. All right, Byron, now I don't want you to call me up and complain that your email is now flooded with lots of different <laughs> uh, uh, email boxes flooded with different emails. Uh, but actually, it's really good advice that, that hey, I, I may push you over to the SMEs or I may and sure put you in the right people. But but it's it's always good news when when federal executives like yourself say they're open to talking to vendors because it you know we talk we hear about the being a partnership and, and it is and in fact uh when we talk partnership our partnership is done for today we, we <laughs> we've uh, i've had a very great conversation i've enjoyed it very much but unfortunately we're out of time for this session of the cloud exchange so let me thank my guest byron atkins is the director of the interior business center in the interior department byron thank you so much for taking the time absolutely it's been an absolute pleasure i've enjoyed the conversation me too. And I'm Jason Miller, and you've been listening to Federal News Network. Now let me send you back to the studio for more from the Cloud Exchange. Mm-hmm.